Thanks for listening to Gossip with Celebrity, brought to you by Celebrity.com. This week, we talk about the royals. We end with our weekly feature, the comments of the week. The stories, photos, and tweets we talk about can be found at Celebrity.com slash podcast under episode 164. Hi, I'm Katie, the founder and editor of Celebrity.com, and I write as Celebrity. And I'm Chandra, I'm the head writer for Celebrity, and I write as Kaiser. So we were off last week because it was Thanksgiving in the U.S., and we should have episodes out for the next two weeks, and then we're going to take about two weeks off for the holidays. Probably longer. Maybe three. (laughs) It depends on what's going on. So last week, I put the name of the podcast as 162 because I second-guessed myself, even though I like have folders that say the podcast number and everything. I had a brain fart or something. So we have two episodes, 162. So this one is 164. Not last week, but the last episode, I numbered 162 again for some reason. So whatever. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. Yay. So now we're on 164. (laughs) So I saw two pretty good documentaries over the break. I saw one on Netflix that came out in 2018, but it's new to me, and it's called The Bleeding Edge, and that's about the largely unregulated medical device industry. It was wild. Like, I cannot believe that they barely regulate those devices. Like, so many people have been harmed by them. And I would recommend anybody to watch that. And then I watched this other documentary that Karen recommended. It's on HBO. And it's about a spiritual drug cult. It's called Love is One, the cult of Mother God. That was crazy. Just this stoner, alcoholic woman, like, created an online cult and had people move to be with her. And they, like, traveled around being stoned and, you know, selling crystals and doing live streams. It was wild. I saw the commercial for it and I was like, no, pass. I hate documentaries about cults. You love that stuff. I have seen so many. Like, (laughs) probably the best I've seen is called The Source Family about this 60s hippie cult. Heaven's Gate Cult of Cults is really good, too. That's on HBO. I've talked about that already. Is the Heaven's Gate one, is that the one where the congressman died? No, that is the Jones. Jonestown? Yeah, Jonestown, the Kool-Aid cult. Yeah, I watched that documentary. Oh, I haven't seen that one. But they did it like a crime documentary, and it was mostly about like the congressman who died or was killed. But that was good because I like the crime stuff. I don't like the yeah, cult stuff. Yeah, like the crime stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't put this on our outline, but I watched on Netflix. I watched Fair Play with um. Okay. I'm gonna fuck up their names. So it's the Phoebe girl redhead from bridgerton phoebe deniver yeah i don't know deniver (laughs) and then alden einreich you know the guy who played the young han solo okay and that was very good it was too long they needed to like edit out about 20 minutes for it to be like really tight yeah but those two actors were very good and it was a really fucked up story about like gaslighting and like a man being like super toxic and it's hard to explain but it was very good okay nice it sounds fun i'll watch the trailer and then decide it's on netflix of course i've been watching the gilded age season two which is gloriously stupid everybody loves that though everyone loves that show it is amazing like it's not even just about like the costumes i just love how fucking stupid it is (laughs) There are like smaller plots like, oh, somebody got married and like, oh, someone was drunk at a tennis match. And and I swear to God, they've had like three separate plot lines about soup. I just fucking love it. It is amazing. In one episode, Oscar Wilde just kind of like waltzed in and almost outed like three different characters. (laughs) Booker T. Washington has also, like, been in a few episodes. Okay. (laughs) It's bizarre. What are the soup scandals? Could you please elaborate (laughs) on one? I'm very interested in this soup plot line. All right. One plot line was that Christine Baranski's character does not believe that soup should be served at lunch or served (laughs) to guests when they have guests over. And her sister had ordered the soup 
specially made for their guest. <laughs> and that was like a big plot line. <laughs> Is that, oh my God, they had soup there. And then there was like a huge society scandal over soup because maybe the soup was poisoned. <laughs> and then there was like a plot to like pour soup on someone's lap. <laughs> Just the soup plot lines alone, it's just magnifique. Oh. They had like a hat and they pulled out of it and soup kept coming out for the writer's room. I don't know. I love it. And people complain about Meryl Streep's daughter. Her character's name is Marion. They're like, oh, she's wooden. She can't act. I love that wooden bitch. She's amazing. Mamie Gummer, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I remember her. I only watched the first season. It's not my thing. I don't think I will keep watching it. But (laughs) it sounds fun. Oh, and like Nathan Lane just coming in and doing the stupidest fucking foghorn leghorn accent out of nowhere. (laughs) Oh, he's in it too. Okay, awesome. All right, let's talk about the Royals. So Omid Scobie's Endgame came out, and it was, it came out Tuesday. That was, like, everything we wanted it to be and so much more. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Amazing book. And I'm only about a third of the way through it. I'm listening to it. I'm almost done with Chapter 7. You got an advanced copy. He contacted you on Twitter, which is really nice. And you just had to sign an NDA that you wouldn't reveal any details before publication. Right. So. Yeah, he's DM'd me a few times, and that's amazing. He's super nice. Obviously, he contacted a few different people, like bloggers, and I think just sort of outside the royalist media people. Some, like, cool people got advanced copies, and that's really nice. And that was you. <laughs> <laughs> so you tweeted on Saturday that you signed an NDA to read it, and that it's really good, and that Scobie was mauling the Windsors. And your tweets are public. Okay, you don't have protected tweets. I'm just saying that because the Telegraph ran a story claiming that it was an exclusive. That was their original title. They've since edited that out to take exclusive out of it. But they were saying Omid was sending his book to Sussex Squad influencers. (laughs) And when you sent me the link to that story, like you didn't put any context. You just wrote, oh, my God. And you sent me the link. I opened it and I was like, oh, I wonder who the influencers are. (laughs) It totally did not occur to me until I scrolled down to our name that it was you, you know, like I I was like, oh, and they were so salty about it. It was wild. The way they framed that, I was like, what? (laughs) I have no idea why they would call me a Sussex Squad influencer. Yeah, I tweet positive stuff about Meghan and Harry, but I'm not, like, a regular on the Sussex Squad chats or whatever. We're Sussex Squad influencers, okay. Like, the (laughs) Sussex Squad would beg to differ, you know? Yeah, seriously. We have overlap with them, but it's not. It just demonstrates a real misunderstanding of what's going on online. Exactly. We support Harry and Meghan. We want to give them a really fair deal. Yeah. We think they've been profoundly wronged, but we also criticize them sometimes. Yeah, and whatever. Like, it just was funny to me. (laughs) And so I'm going to quote them because I want to put that music behind it because it's so silly. So the Telegraph wrote, Eschewing traditional practices, Scobie opted to send the 400-page book to a select group of Sussex Squad bloggers who have long proved supportive. One of them, who identifies herself only as Kaiser, the head writer for a blog called Celebrity, revealed that she signed an NDA and read it at the weekend. (laughs) And then they quoted you saying that the Windsors can't manage their way out of a paper bag. (laughs) (laughs) And I called them the left behind Windsors and they quoted that too. (laughs) That was good. That's what people love. I cannot believe they quoted that full sentence. The left behind Windsors cannot manage their way out of a paper bag. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) So, Omid, he pissed off the press. I mean, he so thoroughly revealed how they've been just basically sucking at their jobs for years to bootlick the Windsors. But also, he only gave excerpts to, like, Paris Match and to the Sunday Times. He really didn't 
give advanced copies to many people. Like he saw exactly what happened with Spare and he was like, not on my watch. Yeah. And he's going to become part of history. He's helping secure the asinine things that the royals did by just chronicling it all. It's just so good. Like, we know most of the details, but he lays them out, like, so logically, and his observations are so pithy and blunt that they're awesome. Yeah, it's a different kind of historical document. Like, I always said that about Harry Spare. Like, that's oh, yeah, a, of a historical document. That's a prince telling his story. But this is a historical biography, if you can say that, about the Windsors for the past, whatever, five or six years. And how it's all gone sideways for them. I like his objectivity and he gives credit where it's due. And then he mocks them where they're due as well. (laughs) So I just want to play an excerpt from the end of chapter two. Like this is just one of his examples of how he summarizes the monarchy. Oprah who? The then Countess of Wessex said in a conveniently timed June 2021 interview and at-home star photo shoot with The Telegraph. You know, if you're not into chat shows, there's no reason why you should know who she is. Certainly not in this country anyway. The same could have been said about them. Whether it was a joke, as a source close to the couple later claimed it was, or not, The comments about the world's most successful black woman and one of the biggest faces in entertainment made them seem stuffy or tin-eared at best, and casually bigoted at worst. What may seem like a trivial episode by itself, Sophie's Oprah gaffe is yet another page to add to the history of recent royal screw-ups. Put together, these miscues make up a dossier that could be used to prove that the institution is an anachronistic, intolerant organisation steeped in bigotry and privilege. And an expensive one at that. (laughs) I mean, he's right. Uh, I love how he phrases things and he's just... This is what they did, you know? Mm-hmm. He, like, just had so many small asides that were, like, we cannot do it justice. You really have to read it or listen to it. He called out the Mirror newspaper when they were trying to, again, center Harry and Meghan when they didn't need to. The Mirror's front page said, stop this royal circus. And Scobie wrote, demonstrating the paper has little or no self-awareness, considering it is often a <laughs> ringmaster for said circus. <laughs> One of my favorites was William's 40th birthday interview, or not interview, but you know, like the Daily Mail piece about his 40th birthday. Well, no, it was like all these quotes in the Daily Mail from one of Prince William's quote friends. And it's all about how much he hates Harry and how he's obsessed with like obsessively watching what Harry and Meghan are doing. And then at the end, it's like, and then the friend said, William just hates the drama. (laughs) This movie goes, could have fooled me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You wrote a little bit about this, about how obviously William and Charles hate each other and compete with each other. Oh, it's really funny. And I mean, we've always known that the whole they're in lockstep. They work together on everything. They consult on everything. That has always been bullshit. That has always been a huge lie. The only thing I believe is that they get along slightly better with Harry gone. And that's only (laughs) out of necessity. Yeah. Only when they're hating on Harry. So you did a review of Endgame and you said that the book is exactly what you expected and more. You also think he wrote it for a couple different audiences, too. Yeah, and I think Finding Freedom was that way. Finding Freedom was good for a primer. It was good for people who had sort of like vaguely supported Harry and Meghan and they wanted to know more about them because they genuinely like had a general like for them. Yeah. And it was a good primer for that. And it also had some like cool little details for the people who had been watching them the whole time and for Sussex Squad, whatever. I think this is more, the details in it are for hardcore royal watchers, but it also acts as a primer for people who are, I guess, more interested in critical coverage of the monarchy. And you can tell it's more of his voice or that the publisher let him 
bring out more of his voice because you know he was co-writing with carolyn durand we yeah. really don't know much about her for the last book but the fighting freedom had a different tone to it it was gentler it was more measured here he's like this is what these clowns have done it was just softer it was a puff piece for megan and harry but since they never got that that's why yeah. it was such a big deal because it was yeah. like sympathetic to them i'm just i'm so impressed with that game well, so, so wait going back to my tweets yeah when i signed the nda like there was so much negativity about scoby and like someone paid for like a bot farm or something because oh, there yeah. were so many like nasty tweets like i'm not gonna read scoby's book i don't know blah, 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 blah. that's why i wrote the tweets in the first place i was like no really i'm reading it you guys it's amazing like <laughs> he's really hand he's given it to the windsors yeah he really delivered with this book i haven't been as good at work like i've been missing little details and things that i have to do every day and you have to remind me like i'm not posting to twitter as much and stuff because i'm just listening to endgame all the time and i'm like damn <laughs> I'm forgetting stuff. Some of the criticism of the book has been just ridiculous and mischaracterizing it, which is what they've done all along with Harry and Meghan. So why should we expect anything different with this book? Scobie went easy on Kate, really. He just, you know, talked about her poor work ethic. And he was called misogynistic for that. Like, come on. It's like <laughs> Taylor Swift getting mad at people saying, you're not a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think generally the criticism of Kate was very mild. It's telling yeah. that they're calling him misogynistic for it. And it's also telling that there's such an outsized focus on the Kate sections as opposed to everything else in the book. All of the criticisms about Charles all of the details about how William fucked over his brother. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. I just want to quote you again, because you really summed up the book. <laughs> you said it was a detailed and well-researched tome of, of their cruelty, their poor management, their blind privilege, their racism, their bigotry, their inability to problem-solve their way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> just a little something for my fans from The Telegraph. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So speaking of how they're mischaracterizing it, one of the big stories at Endgame is that Megan mentioned two names of royal racists when she was corresponding with King Charles about racism. About racism, about people in the royal family asking what color her baby skin would be. And that was after the Oprah interview and the Telegraph reported in April about Megan and Charles exchanging those letters. Yeah. So something I've never been clear on is I think there were multiple conversations about what their baby's skin color would be, because I'm pr I'm almost positive that Harry said that there was a conversation before he and Meghan even got married. Yeah, I remember that. I had yeah, exactly. actually fact checked that because I remembered him saying in the Oprah interview that. Right. But people remember what Megan said, which is there were conversations about concerns about the baby's skin color while she was pregnant. Mm. I'm not sure if people have always remembered that, that there were probably multiple conversations over a period of time about this, like, very racist thing. So she says all that and Harry says all that in the Oprah interview. Charles apparently contacts Megan pretty soon after the Oprah interview. No one says anything about the letters until right before the coronation this year. And oh, yeah. I always thought that Buckingham Palace leaked the fact that they exchanged letters as a way to explain why Meghan didn't go to the coronation. That was my theory. And I think a lot of people kind of shared that theory of he needs some way to explain why <laughs> Meghan doesn't give a shit. So Scobie's big exclusive was that they named two different people who were having these racist conversations. Scobie was very careful. He'd never said anyone's name. And then the Dutch edition, the Dutch translation of Endgame, and all of a sudden all hell broke loose because the Dutch translation suddenly names Charles as the racist or one of the racists. So in the English version... Scobie wrote, but in the pages of these private letters, two identities were revealed. Laws in the United Kingdom prevent me from reporting who they were. Then the Dutch translation 
says it's Charles. And then Scobie did an interview on a British morning show where he said that it's common knowledge among journalists who the racists are. Yeah, which I've always believed as well. Okay. That even when Megan said that in the Oprah interview in 2021, I believe it was already common knowledge that there were already like racist conversations when Harry and Meghan were in the UK. Oof. Kensington Palace, Buckingham Palace, Clarence House, they leaked everything to everyone about Harry and Meghan. You think that they didn't brag about how they were super racist about their baby's skin color? And not thinking it was racist. Yeah. Exactly. They were telling on themselves constantly. Yeah, they still do. Yeah, of course, a lot of Fleet Street journalists already know the identities of who said what, and they just haven't printed it because they're waiting for Omid or Harry or Meghan to actually say the names so, so they Scobie, can attack them. Yes. Scobie has said it's not true that he ever wrote that Charles was the royal racist. He said there's never been a version that I have produced that has names in it. And that, you know, it's a bad translation, basically. I'm summarizing. Yeah. So I've been thinking about it. I wonder if the Dutch translator is like Sussex Squad or, <laughs> or like the Dutch translator is like a shit stir. Well, maybe there's somebody who knew, you know, because they're one of the people who's privy to that information. So Piers Morgan claimed that Kate was named in the inaccurate translation too, which we've never seen. So he seems like he accidentally, in a quote, <laughs> revealed that the other racist is Kate. Which I would believe. Like, I believe Kate more than I believe Charles. Yeah, that's so horrible. Like, why would you say that about somebody's baby? And she thinks it's more offensive that Megan gently said, oh, you have baby brain, you know, haha. <laughs> you know, that's cute. <laughs> Like, how terrible, what a stupid fucking British Karen she is. <laughs> she is. She's exactly a stupid British Karen. Oh, my God. Yeah, I would believe it's Kate. I've always believed that it's William. And these days, I believe I it's Camilla. Camilla. Yeah. yeah. Especially because Piers Morgan is so fucking eager to throw everyone else under the bus. That, oh, yeah. That's kind of the tell that it's Camilla as well. Piers Morgan would say it's Kate because Camilla would tell him to say it's Kate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. As they no, drink and it. talk about all their racist bullshit. And smoke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so another detail from Endgame that you reported on was about how Prince William's press secretary, Chris Jones, Christian Jones did a deal with the horrible blackmailer abuser Dan Wooten to bury the story about William's affair with Rose Hanbury in exchange for tons of negative stories about the Sussexes. Yeah, we've known bits and pieces about this. Yeah. Everyone has been uncovering this in slow motion for years. Mm -hmm. And the Byline Times cover story, that which came out in October, was a big moment for this particular story conspiracy whatever you want to call it that like christian jones absolutely did this and dan wooten was a part of it and william had knowledge about it and it was all centered around trying to change the subject away from rose hanbury and now omen scobie has the detailed timeline of exactly how it went down and his conversations with jones at the time throughout 2019 and i think the most horrible detail even though we knew that the leak came from Christian Jones and from Kensington Palace was the detail about Christian Jones leaking the information about the Sussex, the exit statement as they were writing it as <laughs> Clarence house, Kensington Palace and the Sussex people were writing the statement about the exit. He was leaking it to Dan Wooten. Ugh. Harry wanted his family to recognize that Jones was a leaker. And he, it sounds like he earnestly believed that William didn't know about it and wasn't behind it. I don't know. The way he wrote about it in Spare, it sounded like he wanted to give his brother a chance and he honestly wanted to believe that William didn't know the extent of it. Yeah. How pathetic is that? That like the best case scenario is that William is an empty suit who doesn't know what the fuck is happening in his office. And the truth is even worse, that William knew exactly what was going on. He orchestrated it. Yep. And then the Lord Chamberlain, I had to look up who that was, honestly. He's the most senior officer in all the royal household. Yeah, he's basically like the CEO 
the manager of the Buckingham Palace, basically. So he wrote a threatening letter to Harry. This was an endgame as well, saying that if Harry didn't back down from exposing the leaks to the sun from Christian Jones, that there would be severe consequences. And that was partly in byline times, too. Yeah. They didn't know the exact timeline of exactly who said what. They just knew that Buckingham Palace, Clarence House, Kensington Palace, they all chose Christian Jones over Harry. They all chose to protect Jones rather than a prince. And Harry was the one who was right. He was the one who had all the facts. He understood exactly how it happened, what the deal was between Christian Jones and Dan Wooten. I'm not sure if he knew at that time the extent of William's involvement, but I hope he knows now. And yeah, William is a violent piece of shit. shit. A manipulative, underhanded, violent piece of shit. So that was when Charles cut Harry off for daring to question that, you know, everything about his family was being leaked and the negative stories about Meghan, which were coming from his family, coming from the royals. That still doesn't make complete sense to me, but I believe that Scobie has a pretty accurate timeline. I personally think that Harry and Meghan's security and finances were cut off long before July 2020. I wondered about that too, and I don't even know that much about it, but yeah, I thought they were cut off like right when they left. I believe that they were cut off at the end of March, because that was around the same time that they got in contact with Tyler Perry. So they basically left Harry and Meghan with no security or money. And we saw that in the Harry and Meghan docuseries as well. It's crazy to see it laid out with such clear cause and effect, what they did to Harry and his family and how they tried to destroy him. The financial abuse, the emotional abuse. Yeah. Yeah. So Piers Morgan also wrote in his column in The Sun this week that, quote, Harry would do well to heed the warning of Dionysus, the tyrant who has left a broken man by his constant warmongering and got finally bumped off by his own fed up family. So Piers Morgan is threatening that Harry's going to get murdered. Yeah. So we all know what's going to happen if Piers has his way and the royal family has his way because Piers and Camilla are so buddy buddy. They and are. Piers pretty much speaks for the royal family. And that was laid out really clearly in Endgame as well. Yeah. Weirdly, like, this is just a complete side note. In that same column, he mentions Samantha Markle out of nowhere. And I have always believed that he is intimately involved with Thomas Markle and Samantha Markle and that he's financing and scripting what they're doing. Probably, and that whole lawsuit she has against Megan for daring to say, like, she didn't grow up with any siblings, like, what? Yeah, like, that's just a theory. I have no evidence to back me up, but I think we'll find out eventually that Pierce was largely behind it. I really do. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. All right, let's move on to the comments of the week. Oh, my comment of the week <laughs> is from a great Sorry. Linda Evangelista interview in the Times, I think. And she was talking about how she's not dating anyone and she doesn't want to date. And she said, I don't want to hear somebody breathing. <laughs> <laughs> and every comment on that thread is pretty much gold because woman after woman is like, yeah, we totally agree. I feel that so hard. <laughs> I don't ever want to see a man's dirty socks. I don't want to hear him breathing. I don't want to hear him chewing. Well, anyway, so my favorite comment was one of the first ones. Crow Hood said, sometimes when my husband breathes or chooses food, I not only don't want to be married to him, I just don't want him on this planet. (laughs) When I was married, I used to hate hearing my husband chew. It sounds so loud to me. And I was like, oh, I have misophonia, right? Which is where you have like a irrational like intense response to stuff but i just oh he chewed so loud and i would have to like leave because i didn't want to hear him chew i have to like really concentrate hard or walk away when someone eats and bites their utensils i cannot stand that and i hate how they like 
the TikToks where people are eating and talking at the same time, like put your food down, put your makeup on or something, whatever, that's fine. But I don't want you eating. It's gross. I can handle that. It's just biting down on a fork. Oh, shut okay. up. Stop it. <laughs> All right, my comment of the week is on Rosie's post where Jennifer Garner was opening up her backpack and she pulled out, like, no joke, eight bags of different kinds of nuts, like, that she just had, like, deep in her backpack and she was kind of laughing at herself. And she had tons of bags of candy, too. And Concern Faye said, I once decided I needed to carry dental floss with me, emptied my bag and found six bags of dental floss. (laughs) I put so much crap in my bag. I could totally relate to that. I remember when Angelina Jolie did one of those what's in my bag thing. And she was like, oh, I'm a mom. And it was like so chic. She has like the most perfect like little French candies in her purse. She's like, I'm a mom. I have <laughs> oh, these I candies. I remember that. <laughs> no, Jennifer Garner had a ton of stuff. Oh, my gosh. When I was pregnant, I used to carry hard boiled eggs because I would Ooh. get hungry all the time. <laughs> And I once forgot it, and I picked it up, and it was like all liquidy and brown. <laughs> it's gross. I had to like empty the purse out and put baking soda in it to get the smell out. <laughs> One time, I forgot that like a restaurant gives away mints, and I forgot that like I grabbed the mints and just kind of shoved them in my purse. <laughs> They all and then like I keep my purse like right by the front door and I was like what are all these ants doing by the <laughs> front door <laughs> I was like god I can't believe I have an ant problem the in the foyer the <laughs> then I was like what are all these ants doing in my purse <laughs> oh my gosh in my old house, I used to eat on the couch and the ants would come back. <laughs> I stopped doing that. All right. Well, thanks for listening, bitches. Thanks, bitches. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen. If you like us, please turn off your ad blocker when you visit our site. You can text us or leave a voicemail at 434-218-3219. Our music is from AA Alto, Maiden, and via Premium Beat and Sound of Picture. Thanks again. I feel like there's so much more we could say about Endgame. It's crazy. We'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it next week, I'm sure. Because I'm sure there's going to be an update on all of the racist royal stuff because if Pierce Morgan <laughs> keeps talking keep... <laughs> it probably was Camilla because that's why he's saying it's Kate yeah or that's yeah. why he's saying it's Charles <laughs> 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 Camilla's like saying it's anybody but me <laughs> right <laughs>